Distinguished guests and fellow colleagues, welcome to the CLC Lecture Series. My name is Rayanne and I am from CLC, the Centre for Livable Cities. The Centre was jointly established by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources in 2008 to distill, create and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. The CLC Lecture Series is one of the platforms through which urban thought leaders share best practices and exchange ideas and experiences. In today's session, we are honoured to have with us Professor Jan Gell of the Urban Design at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts and founding partner of Gell Architects. In this lecture, Professor Gell will share his experiences in enhancing the quality of urban life through a people-centric approach in city planning. The format for today's lecture will start off with a presentation by Professor Gell. This will be followed by a closed panel discussion and a Q&A session with the audience. This will be moderated by Mr. Wong Man Sam, co-founding co director of WUHA, an internationally acclaimed architectural practice based in Singapore. Before the session begins, we would like to invite and welcome Mr. Ku Teng Chai, executive director of CLC, to give the opening remarks. Mr. Ku, please. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure today to have talking to us as part of our CLC lecture series, the one person who really personify the idea what it takes to make a city livable. I think Mr. Yan Gell has been the champion and, and really the, the, the person who has had the most influence perhaps in in many, many cities, moving away from you know, cities being planned for cars to cities that are planned for, for people and bicycles, right? So he is a person who I think many of us know uh, from his work and his writings. I think his most famous book that captures all his ideas, uh, if you have not read it, I will highly recommend you get a copy. It's a... Uh, and if today he's here, you know, you can get his autograph as well, right? Without additional cost, right? Yeah. <laughs> Cities for People, I think it's a wonderful book. I was given a copy of it. Uh, of course, I was given a copy personally autographed by Ian. But before that, when I first became, you know, the executive director of CLC, my predecessor, uh, Andrew Tan, you know, gave that as a copy to, to me, you know, as a kind of a welcome gift to CLC. And I... I, I really treasure you know, uh, that, that book. So I think I would highly recommend uh, everybody to, to read that book after you have listened to him today. I think his work has had a lot of impact, not only in his native city of Copenhagen, which today is one of the most sustainable cities in the world, and I think they have ambitions to be you know, a city that is carbon neutral, etc., by 2025. And in fact, it is a city that you know, I've been visiting Copenhagen on a regular basis, probably since the early 2000s when I was chief executive of PSA because I had to every now and then pay homage to my big customer, Musk Line. Uh, uh, but in those days, you know, Copenhagen was, was really a far cry from what Copenhagen, Copenhagen has become now in the last probably 10 years or so. A very vibrant city where now, what, 37, 38% <clears throat> of the people who who uh, work in the city actually uh, cycle to work. So it's, got, it's, an, it's, an, it's an amazing city that is really a, a city for people. But he has gone beyond Copenhagen and he has also had influence in London, in New York, in Sydney and in Melbourne. And he's also no stranger to Singapore, having been here several times since 1993, conducted workshops. So he has got some understanding of what our you know, challenges are in Singapore. And uh, this time around, we are honoured that he has agreed to accept an invitation by the CLC to be a vis visiting fellow and to give this talk and among the other things to do uh, a bit of work for us, uh, quite a bit of work in, in a couple of days that's with us. I think since he arrived from Sydney 2 a.m. yesterday morning, he has been kind of flat out, you know, working with us since 8 o'clock yesterday morning. He went on a bike uh, with us in Ang Mo Kio, 
uh, under the grueling hot sun in Singapore, uh, then went over to Tampines later in the evening and, and so on. So he had a very long day yesterday. Uh, and then this, today he's kind of giving this talk plus lots and lots of interviews and so on. So uh, I think we really do appreciate the, the amount of time he's uh, spending with us uh, and, and the wonderful advice uh, uh, that he's giving uh, all of us. And we hope that Singapore does benefit from you know, the wisdom um, uh, of uh, Ian Gill. So I think for, for today's talk, uh, uh, I think he has some ideas also for Singapore, and I, 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 I think we all will look forward to, uh, to listening to him. I think the moderator, uh, after his talk, to, to kind of engage all of us in the Q&A, He's also a very well-known uh, Singapore personality, one of our top architects, Mr. Wong Man Sam, uh, who is uh, founding director of WOHA, who, as you all know, has done many, many wonderful projects in Singapore. And the most uh, uh, important one right now is that wonderful hotel, the hotel, uh, hotel what, Royal Hotel at Pickering, Park Royal Hotel at Pickering, which is uh, famous now as probably the greenest hotel in Singapore, if not the greenest hotel in the world. So let's welcome Yen now to give us a talk. Uh, thank you very much for the welcome and thank you Center for Livable Cities to invite me back to Singapore. I have a special relationship with Singapore. I've been here so many times that they talk about me as the Danish homing pigeon who comes back here ever so often. Now it will be almost two months before I'm here to again, so um, I cannot, I, I can't resist it. I'm coming back. It's not very good to come back that, that frequently because then you have to find something new to tell and some new jokes to make and <laughs> that's not very good. Also, I talked to the minister, uh, Heng, yesterday and he said that he'd seen my lecture on the, on the YouTube and he heard all the jokes there. So <laughs> now that when the jokes are also on YouTube, I'm even more worried. But let's start, let's start anyway. I'll tell you a little, very nice story. I was down in, in Vietnam to publish one of my books in Vietnamese, and I met this lady, Mrs. Lan, from the Danish Embassy. And she's just been in Copenhagen for a conference for embassy employees, and she asked me the question right away, oops, Sorry about that. Next one. She asked me right away, do you have a baby boom in Copenhagen? Baby boom in Copenhagen? No. We have a problem with reproduction. Two, 200 years from now, there'll be no more Danes in Denmark. <laughs> baby boom, no way. But, but all these kids, in Denmark, you must have a baby boom. Oops, I never thought about it. But if you are in Copenhagen, there are many children, and they are very visible. First, there are, there are all these people who have maternity leave, and they have a baby pram, and they go around with it for one year, and that gives a lot of baby prams on the streets. But then, but then, we have a, a, a transport system which is very people friendly. Uh, every 30% uh, of all Danish families with children in Copenhagen, they have a, babe, a, a, a cargo bicycle for the children where they can drive the children to the school or to the kindergarten. And I can tell you that the children love this kind of transportation because they can sit there and see everything as opposed to being trapped in a car and sit on the rear seat. And here, mom and dad can talk to the kids while in the car, they'll turn around and say, shut up and wait until we stop. <laughs> so Copenhagen is full of these um, 
transport um, bikes, and they are there all the year, as you can see. And also on all the bicycles of the mothers or fathers in Copenhagen, you can see hanging one, two, or sometimes three children being taken gently to the, to the kindergarten or to the school. And bicycling in Denmark is very, very important. When you are three years or at, at latest four years, you have to learn to bike. These are two, my two, or two of my grandchildren, and I noticed them, how eager they were and how much they worked and how much it meant for them. I can bicycle now. Life can begin. <laughs> and the moment you can bicycle, then you can go out in the city with your parents. And my daughter has told me that from they are four or five, you can easily take the children along on bicycle on their own, as long as you have a good bicycle infrastructure with curbs out to the traffic, then it's all right. And, and also, this is one of the little things in Copenhagen which, which gives us more children on the street. Every time there is a small, narrow street going into a major street, they always take the sidewalk across and the bicycle lane across because the, the, the pedestrians and the bicyclists, they are just as important as any guy in a Mercedes-Benz coming from a side street. So they always take they make continuous sidewalks, continuous bicycle lanes in big streets. I thought that was great. But then my daughter told me, would you imagine how wonderful this is? Because now Laura, who is seven, she can walk all the way to school on her own um, because she can walk on the sidewalk all the way to the school. Earlier on, she had to negotiate three streets and it's a fantastic difference if you can walk on the sidewalk to the school and have the Mercedes-Benz go over sidewalks rather than having seven-year-olds go over streets. So it dawned on me that what Mrs. Lan in Vietnam had seen was a city where the children in the city were very much part of daily day life. And then I started to think about that maybe having many children visible in the city or having many old people also using the ordinary city spaces, that's a true sign of a people-friendly, livable cities. So whenever you go anywhere, just see if you can see the children and the old people on the ordinary streets. I realized that in Vietnam you saw very little children in the cities because there was too much traffic, it was too noisy, too polluted, it was too dangerous and all the kids were kept way out in the suburbs with the grandparents and whatever, but not in the city. We don't have a baby boom, but Copenhagen is a rather livable, baby, children-friendly city, which is nice. So this was the start of something, but not what I'm going to talk about, because today I'm going to talk about livable cities for the 21st century, and I'm, my point is, that a people-oriented planning strategy brings you a very long way towards a livable city. Be good to the people and you have a much more livable city. Um, I will start with a very short version of my life. I graduated as an architect 52, 54 years ago in 1960. I was trained in the worst days of traffic of city planning ever. I was trained in the heyday of the modernists. I was, I was told in school that cities are bad and freestanding buildings are good. I was told that streets are bad, but grass is good. So the more grass and the more freestanding buildings, the better. Never put residence, workplace, recreation and communication together. Always separate them. Great. I swallowed it all and I went, came rushing out of School of Architecture to do all these wonderful new things. And this was what I was about to do when 
then, um, then, uh, then, then, then I married a psychologist. <laughs> and, uh, and that was an interesting experience in many ways, of course. Um, but suddenly, we young architects and these young so, so sociologists and psychologists, we had many, many discussions about what was going on in the area of architecture and planning. Did we know enough about people to make these big decisions about how people should live? Um, what, what information did we have in our uh, education about people's needs and what people would prefer and like and how these structures would influence their, their quality of life? And, and they also said, why are you architects not interested in people? Well, that was a very hard sentence. And actually, that forced me to go back to School of Architecture, where I spent another 40 years to study how the built form influences life and how life interacts with buildings to find out about the people and the life in the cities and not only about the form, which we heard so much about in School of Architecture. It ended up, it's not ended actually, we, I'm still producing books, but we made rather many books and they, it's a great joy for me that they've come out in many, many countries across the world and that these little modest books have been found useful in the development of places like Bangladesh and Vietnam and Iran. Then, later in my life, when I got luckily got out of architecture school again when I was retired. I was thrown out actually because I got too old. But um, then we started Gale Architects, a consultancy firm, where we hoisted this flag, if you want a livable city, a safe city, a sustainable city, and a healthy city, we can help you. And since then, we have been extremely busy in all corners of the world. And and it, it, to me, it's a fantastic expression that around the world there is an enormous interest in livable cities, in people-friendly cities, from one end of the world to the other. I'll tell you a little bit more about this. The most northern client we have is Nuuk in Greenland, the capital of Greenland. I will be there next week. It will be slightly less warm than here. The southernmost client has been the rebuilding of Christchurch. And we are working in Shanghai now, in New York, in, in San Francisco, and Moscow is not on the map yet, but, but certainly on the map in my talk. Um, it's been fantastic to see in such a short time all these cities started to ask for information about more livable cities. Um, in my research, I've been very lucky that we have in Denmark a stinking rich foundation for the built environment. And in certain times, they have almost had problems in getting rid of their money. And they, they took quite a bit of interest in, they say, Jan, you're working with this human dimension in city planning. We find that this is extremely interesting and valuable. Would you like some money? And, and, and then I got some money and we started up a, a research center at the School of Architecture. And uh, they have been very, very supportive throughout in this work to promote people-oriented planning and architecture. Then at some point recently, three years ago, they came again and say, oh, Jan, would you sit down and write down everything you know while you can still remember it? And um, I said I had no time, and then they said, it, I, we guess it's a matter of having enough assistance. And then they started to throw money after me. And suddenly I had time, and then we made this book, which, much to my joy and somewhat to my surprise, has in three years been distributed all over the, the world. In, it's even in Chinese long ago, and, and, and yeah, it's in Danish also, but the, one of the newest one is in Greece, in Greek, 
And the Greek came and said, we would like to translate your book into Greek. And I said, Greece? No, you shouldn't. You have much more thing, better things to use your money for. Uh, for. Forget about my book. Use your money for some useful things. And then they say, no, 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 don't worry. We, we got all the money from the Danish embassy. Okay. <laughs> so we uh, published the Greek version. Um, what I'm t t in this book, I had the privilege to look back at 50 years of research and practice in this area of, of people-oriented city planning. And of course, I could realize that around 1960, there were two important changes in the background of planning worldwide. That was the, the introduction in big scale of the modernistic ideologies, which really happened around 1960. And the other one was the invasion of the motor car, which started at different times in different cultures. But in, in Europe and, and America, um, it really started in the big way around 1955, 60. And what happened with this was that the moment the motor cars arrived, we all got so obsessed with the motor cars and we allowed them at once to occupy every single space in the existing cities. And over the years, of course, uh, we've seen a gradual erosion of quality for people all over the world. And we've seen that the traffic engineers became stronger and stronger as a profession. Everything had to do with capacity to have room for more cars, room for more car parking. Um, it, it's very bad in, in, in many cities, but maybe we can all be happy that it's more bad in Romania, in Bucharest. However, they've now got my book in Bucharest, so it will <laughs> soon be much better. Some of the things which has happened with all this uh, to, um, uh, automobile invasion is that we have lost our sense of scale. In the old days, all cities were in five kilometer an hour scale. The spaces were small. The signals were small, there were many details, you could see the people, and you had anything in the city was up close, and still you can see the mountains in the distance. Now, gradually, we make everything in 60 kilometer an hour scale, where you have big spaces and big signs, and there are no details, and sensually, it's not at all very interesting to walk around here. We used to have cities in five kilometer scale, like Venice here, where everybody walk and all the spaces are small and you have a lot of sense expressions going around in a place like this one. And now we have 120 kilometer an hour cities where you can go for hours and hours and it will never be interesting. What happened also was that every single city in the world at once got a transport and traffic department which at once as good professionals started to count all the cars going east and going west and they had perfect statistics of everything and everything, every time there was something planning to be done, all these statistics from the transport departments were very useful and meant that the cars were looked well after. In all these 50 years, not a single city had a department for pedestrians and public life. And in all these 50 years, almost no city had any documentation, knowledge, or statistics about how people use the city. And that has, has become a very great problem because you always plan for what you know. And if there's a big sector where you know very little, then it's generally being overlooked. This has been for many years a situation. It is now quickly changing. So the invasion of the motor car was one of the paradigm changes. The other paradigm change was this introduction of, of um, modernism. And actually modernism 
was formulated in the 20s and in the 30s, and it, it was in many ways a very, very radical ideology. This is from Corbusier, his plan for New Paris, and roughly the plan was to take everything down in Paris and put up 24 high-rise buildings where everybody could live and have a good time with a lot of grass. So it was a very radical departure from everything we knew about good urban habitat to a very radical new situation. Um, what literally happened was that we had to expand all the cities very rapidly and the planners had to get up in aeroplanes and look at the big area from above and put down the various objects and the site planners to, to handle these big new development, they had to be up in helicopters and put down the buildings like this. But what also happened was that the people scale, down where people were, nobody was asked to look after it. That became a wonderful uh, place for people. So the, instead of making spaces as we did in the old cities, now we made in-betweens and hoped that people would like them. Generally, they did not like them very much. This is how modernistic plan, planning looked in Scandinavia. And this is a later stage in Singapore, but basically it is children of the modernistic movement we are handling here. And a thing which also happened in this is that we, we, we got confused about scale because we used to have small scale for people and now we could suddenly make enormous buildings, enormous, and we had very big companies who needed very big buildings and then we had these fantastic differences in scale. And I know of no place where you can see it more clearly than here in Singapore River when you have the old colonial human scale uh, boat key here and the new buildings next to it. And when you show it to anybody, you wonder, is it the same species who shall live there and there? I think one is for people, the other is for dinosaurs or elephants. Uh, but the point is that we as architects and planners, really in this process when we could modernize and, and produce so big things, we lost the sense for details for human scale. Here is some confusion. It is a brand new city in China where they have managed to narrow down Main Street to 90 meter so they can have a charming new town. <laughs> These are something which has happened in the past 50 years. Now, definitely, we have had a change of mindset coming to one place after the other. And today, we are definitely working to new paradigms in architecture and city planning and if you ask what is wanted today, if you ask any mayor in the world, would you like a lively, livable city, a safe city, a sustainable city, and a healthy city? He would say, that's my program. That's me. That's us. Uh, and my point is that if we are sweet to the pedestrians, to the people, whether they are walking or bicycling, we actually have a more lively, more livable, more safe, more sustainable, and more healthy city. So starting with the people is a good place to start to make a more livable city. Um, increasingly, we can see that life, lively and livable, is something we just ask for very much. We live more and more scattered. We live in smaller and smaller households. We have more and more leisure time. We have a more aging population. We have more years in our life. And we have increasingly a privatized organized so we could do everything privatized. But we always, as a human being, was a social being. There was always a private side and a social side. And the social side is not really comforted by a very privatized living situation. So we can see that whenever we make anywhere in the world good public spaces where people can quietly come together and have a good time and see each other 
enjoy each other, then we can see these are happily being used. Also, if we are more focused on people, we will have a more people or a better human scale where people will feel more comfortable, just as we had in the old cities, because man is still this high, his senses are still the same, he can still reach this much, and he's still a walking animal. So not much has changed apart from the architecture. Also, if we have a more people-oriented architecture, we will have safer places and we'll feel safer, more comfortable among other people. And increasingly, we realize that we have to do something about the, the climate challenge. If more people walk and more people bicycle, it is in itself very good for the climate. But in the future, where to a higher extent, we'll have to use other modes of transportation than having each of us four rubber wheels in the corners, we will need to use uh, public transportation more and you will have to have much better public transportation but good public transportation and good public realm they really are two sides of the same coin both have to be good to have a good transportation system and then we've got a new problem which is increasingly being uh, addressed with great worry in America and Canada in Australia and in Europe, and the worst place in the world is actually Saudi Arabia. Um, and that is that we have organized our world so we don't need to move at all. We can sit on our behinds all day. And, and the old situation where we work manually, many of us, has been superseded by a new situation where we sit and work, and we sit and get transport. We sit, sit, sit. And when we look at it, we have made a city planning which invites people not to move. And we have now a terrible problem with people dying out of not moving. I thought that the problem was that people got fat. So when they get fat, they die. But a doctor told me, no, you can be very fat, but if you are active, no problem. If you are very slim and inactive, you are in a bad way. And she also told me that if you do one hour of moderate activity every day, like walking for an hour or bicycling for an hour, you have seven extra years of life expectancy. And you have a much better life because much less hospitalization, medicine, doctors. So you are much cheaper for society if you move every day. And then it realized, of course, that we as architects and planners can make the city planning in such a way that it would be very natural and logical thing for us to move in the course of our daily day. So we have been on a wrong track trying to have everybody sit all the time. If you look at the World Health Organization from United Nations, they have a number of things they advise and in their Policy, you can see that everybody shall ensure that walking, cycling, and other forms of physical activity are accessible to all, and we shall introduce transport policies that promote active and safe methods of traveling to and from school and walk places, such as walking and bicycling. They strongly promote that we make activity in daily day life as part of the livable cities program. And as pointed out before, this in itself is very good for a livable city. So, do we have cities which have this policy, let's walk and bike as much as possible? Not only on Sundays, but also on Mondays and the other weekdays, in the everyday situation. I have told also here in Singapore several times about Copenhagen, and I shall try to do it as quickly as I can. But Copenhagen has been at it now for 50 years. The first, in, in 62, they pushed back the, the cars from their main street. It was very, very radical, and everybody thought that the mayor was crazy. And everybody said it would never work. We are Danes, we are not Italians, we'll never walk 
because Danes don't walk, they watch television, all this sort. And the further the climate was too bad, we could not come out of the houses. So they closed the street anyway. And next year we were Italians because suddenly we had space to be Italians and we had the need to promenade and to look at the girls, whatever we, you do in cities, just as everybody else. It was a big success and they have continued now for 52 years to continue this policy of humanizing the city, making more and more spaces uh, pleasant for people to be in. All the squares in Copenhagen were full of parked cars. All the squares are by now cleared of parked cars and turned over to people activities. As one of the first cities, actually the first city in the world, Copenhagen was a place where the use of the city by the people were monitored were documented systematically year by year, and we did it from the university as a research piece. And gradually the city saw that that was very interesting. So after a number of years, we worked together with the city. Every time the city did something, we at university went out and made books and articles proving that it was a very good idea and more people were coming and they were more happy and the businessmen were more happy, so what was the problems? So we found that having, st studying how the city is used by people is a very strong political instrument for improving the city for people. This was pioneered in Copenhagen and is now used all over the world in many, many cities, as I shall tell you. But in Copenhagen, they not only did the city center quite nicely, they have continued this policy over the years, and they have systematically made this policy, we shall walk all over the city as much as possible. All the streets shall be pleasant to walk in. The city, this, all the streets lo used to look like that one up there, and all the streets have now been converted from four-lane streets to two-lane streets, never one-way streets, always two-way streets, and now with Median, two lanes of traffic, street trees with parking under the street trees, bicycle lanes and sidewalks. This street is much more beautiful and it's much, much more safe for people and it can take almost as many cars as this street could because modern transport engineers, they are much smarter than they were in the 1970s. Is this what we are doing now in Copenhagen? No, not quite. We have not come to this yet. <laughs> but, but as I told you before, we are systematically making... Uh, it's not a human right that whenever a car sees a corner, he can drive to any side at will. That's not in the Un United Nations Human Rights Charter. It's something the traffic engineers have told us over many years. In Copenhagen, this is being questioned. You can only turn at certain points when you have traffic lights uh, because then you don't disturb the other lane and whatever, and you can have a more smooth traffic. And my little granddaughter, Laura, can walk to school. Copenhagen now have an official policy. We shall be the best city for people in the world. And they have very detailed demands, one, it's a hard time to live in Copenhagen. We have to walk 20% more inside the next five years, and that, that's, that's hard work, but, but we'll have to do it to fulfill this goal. Also in Copenhagen, they have this policy of inviting people to bicycle. They have by now a completely good bicycle system in all the major streets with curb on either side, and it's completely from door to door. It is providing now a complete transport network where you can transport everything all over the city. You don't need a car. You can easily live without. And if you have a base or shallow, you can also transport that one. And they realize that the, the, the difficult points in the bicycle system is the crossings, and they've done a number of things like special colors in crossing and putting the light on seven seconds before for the, for the bicycle so they can get across before the cars start. 
Um, to have a good bicycle system, it must be integrated with other systems so it become a real system. All taxis shall take two uh, bicycles and in the trains we can take for free our bicycles and that's very practical because then if we have to go 25, 30 kilometer, you, you pedal two kilometer, go by train 20 kilometer and pedal two kilometer, fine. That is exactly what my wife and I can do when we have to go to my son's place. We cannot bicycle 25 kilometer, but we can bicycle for and take the rest with the train, smart. Over the years, with all these improvements done in the city, there has become developed a bicycle culture. It's in its, its lifestyle to bicycle. The businessmen bicycle, the pregnant mothers bicycle, the children bicycle, the crown prince bicycle with his little kids, half Australian kids by the way, over to the kindergarten. And I'll just tell you a little human story. This is a story about my 45th anniversary with my dear wife. And we were sitting out in our home out there and it was a nice August day and, and then we decided we should celebrate by having a nice dinner. So we took our bicycles and started in towards the city and we bicycled up and down the streets of the city. We went across the harbor and finally we find a nice place in a new sidewalk restaurant which was not there when we were married. Actually there were no sidewalk restaurants at that time. And then we had a very good dinner and you can see after having a dinner on bicycle you can have one extra glass of red wine. So you can go a little bit wavy and then, <laughs> then we got home and we realized that on this day and we were almost 136 years together, we were not quite young, um, and we had done 20 kilometers on our 45th uh, anniversary, and then we sat and talked about that when we were married, all this was not possible. Elderly people could not bicycle side by side on safe and good bicycle infrastructure all over the city and choose between 7,000 outdoor cafe seats in all the nice places all over the city. And we realized that we had been very lucky to live in a city where every year for 45 years, when we woken up, we knew that the city was a little bit better than it was yesterday. Because we had this feeling that so much good things have happened over the time that it is definitely a much better city now than when we got married. Uh, just to give you an idea, if this was in London, we could have started by, Mar by Marble Arch and gone over to Whitechapel and gone over to Southwark and then gone back again, you've done 20 kilometers. You cannot do that in London. You can hardly do that in New York, but we could do it in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen now, we have all this with that 37 go to work on bicycles, that's fine. Every Copenhagener now, 55% of all people in Copenhagen are on their bikes every day. Uh, Camilla, my colleague, she just told that in her household of four, they have 11 bikes. Copenhagen now has a policy, we will be the best city in the world for bicycling. And they have staked out a number of goals, including that Copenhagen will be CO2 neutral by 2025. Do we have problems in Copenhagen? Yes, we have problems now because we have congestion on the bicycle lanes. It's really awful. Everybody is complaining about it. And so something had to be done. Here is a scheme from London by Norman Foster. Is this how we do it? It's completely silly, this scheme. Who will go up a ramp to, the, to 30 meters high and go around in heavy winds and London fog up there where there are no, no young girls to look at the sidewalk? <laughs> and it's just a transport engineer's delight of getting from A to B, but bicycling is not about that. 
bicycling is being a little bit fast pedestrian where you can be in the city and enjoy the city, see the people in the city, be seen, jump off the bicycle, jump on again, go in and buy something. All this is about what bicycling is about. So this is not a way to get more capacity. So what do we do in Copenhagen? We double all the bicycle lanes. And what do we get the asphalt for that? We take another lane from the cars because a bicycle lane can take five times more people than a car lane. So it's good transport economy if you have enough bicycles to take some more asphalt and give to them, which is what is being done. Also in the trains, they've been forced to double all the capacity for taking the, the bicycle on the trains. That's one of the next things to come here in Singapore. Just, and what happened when the new Danish government had to go up to the Queen to get their commission as ministers? They arrived on bicycles and drove up to the guards and put their bicycles next to the garden. They would you look after my bicycle? I have some business to do with the queen. Then they went in and did the business. And then, lo and behold, if you look at the list of livable cities in the world, you will find in Monarch 2013 that Copenhagen is way up in the top. And I think it has much to do with all these people-oriented policies, which makes it a good city to live in for all generations many children on the street. Other cities with same policy. Melbourne has for 30 years followed a very similar policy. And I happen to know because I've been consulting for and a good friend of Rob Adams and been helping them with their work for the past 30 years. And those of you who know Melbourne know that it's a little bit of a miracle what has happened to one of the dullest and most uninteresting city centers in the world, who is now one of the nicest cities in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it is almost a miracle what has happened in Melbourne. And also Melbourne now is full speed introducing what they call a Copenhagen-style bicycle system. And what is Copenhagen-style? That is to put the parked cars outside so they, the parked cars protect the bicycles instead of having the bicycles to protect the parked cars, which they have many places. Um, so if I can give you a good advice, if you don't know where to go, move to Melbourne. <laughs> it's by far the nicest city in Australia. But other cities in Australia are working very hard to Melbourneize. They won't call it Melbourne Ice in Sydney, but they are trying to. <laughs> Sydney is very good for Olympics and summits and opera houses, but the quality in the city center of Sydney is not very good. But now they, have, they are full speed um, doing something about it. We, we are far advanced in getting rid of all the traffic in George Street and introducing light rail the length of George Street, and they are very excited about this. Also, they are introducing bicycle systems all over, and they have a firm policy in this city, we walk and we bike as much as possible and take the public transportation. If you look at this list of most livable cities in the world from Monocle last year, you can see Melbourne and Copenhagen is up on the top, but you can see that Sydney, Oakland, Zurich, Stockholm, um, they, those are cities which definitely have worked very hard for the people side of the story. They are also very high on this list. Uh, New York, we have not really time to talk about, but the mayor in New York, he promised everybody New York will be the greenest, the most sustainable metropole in the world in no time to speak of. And then he started a very ambitious program uh, there's a lot of people who were walking. They were shuffling from the subway to office and back again. There were hardly a bench, a, a chair, or a cafe chair in New York. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Also, the bicycles were used to protect the parked cars. They, they were not so happy about this, and they made a poster telling about <laughs> their situation. But then came the mayor's, Michael Bloomberg's new plan, 
that they should have a 4,000 kilometer bicycle system in no time to speak of. And actually they've done, I think they've done between four and 500 kilometer in, in, uh, in six, five years. Um, and they are rolling it out with American speed. This is 9th Avenue in the spring and 9th Avenue in the summer of 2009. 2008, actually. And they are rolling out their bicycle system in all the parts of New York, saying this is not a matter of Manhattan. It is Brooklyn. It is Bronx. It is Queens. It is Staten Island. It is about that here we bicycle. And also, they began to think about that they needed a good boulevard to be proud of, like Charles LEC in Paris. And they looked around, say maybe Broadway would be the thing. And they started to experiment with widening the sidewalk and putting in bicycle lanes. And after a while, they started to think that maybe they could do more. And then they found out that maybe they could, they didn't need Broadway for traffic after all. And then they were able to close Broadway in the points in the city where there were absolutely most people. That was the Hill Square and that was a Times Square. This is Times Square in the spring of 2009, and this is Times Square in the summer of 2009. And the mayor said to everybody, don't worry, this is an experiment. I know it's very radical to ask people in New York to enjoy their city, but we tried out as an experiment. Half a year later, he came back and said, experiment? No way, it is one of the best successes we've had in American planning for the past 50, 60 years. It's going to stay. Now they are paving it and making it nice and dandy. They now have changed. Everything has changed New York. Now instead of I love New York, they say I sat in a deck chair on Times Square. <laughs> and New Yorker has followed up on this recreative motive by bringing in the, the prairies and the bisons, whatever. Um, and also all over the world, this has been, there has been resonance from this because as, as Frank Sinatra, he was singing on Broadway, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Singapore, Singapore, <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> There's a direct connection between this task we did in New York and the next task we were invited to in Galilee, that was human, humanizing Moscow. And that was starting in 2011, and we came over and had a look at Moscow, and it didn't look so good. Because they, they had bought a lot of cars, and they thought that freedom from communism is the right to park everywhere you fancy. And uh, they did, and that was not so smart, in the beginning, it was good, but then later on, it was not so smart. So this was one of the streets in Moscow, typical street. This is another typical Moscow scene. This is typical Moscow parking. This is typical Moscow pedestrian crossing. And here you can, you can rehearse your slalom, <laughs> pedestrian crossing. Here is Main Street, Moscow, cars parked all the way. The air is full of advertisement, and there's one meter left for people to promenade up and down Main Street, Moscow. Um, the first thing they did was to say, how many books have you written, Jan? Come with them. I'll, we'll translate them. So they got three of them. And it was the city of Moscow who published them, and they give them out for free. Um, the, the worried guy is the Danish ambassador. Um, then we were commissioned to make a study of Moscow, as we've done in Melbourne, in Sydney, in London, in New York, and in, now in Moscow, and we did this study. And while we were doing this study, um, I was invited to have a little chat with the mayor. And he said, what would be in your report? I said, yeah, maybe parking on the sidewalk on Main Street, Moscow, is not the greatest idea I ever saw. Then I came back two months later, no cars, no more. That's efficient democracy. <laughs> and then 
if the Russians forget the new rules, the mayor has a little <laughs> car here, which takes your car directly to Siberia. <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful to be working with a democracy which is so consistent. <laughs> and then you think that this is rather radical, but look at this, this is, <laughs> this is a mayor in Vilnius in Lithuania who teaches people not to park in his bicycle lanes. You never do that twice. But in Moscow, there has been a miracle. A year and a half coming back to Moscow and going down to the same place in Main Street. And furthermore, the sun has come out. But anyway, instead of cars parked and the whole sky cluttered with advertisement, now you have benches the whole length, you have trees, and they've got rid of all the ad advertisements, and you can see Kremlin in the distance, and they are starting on a new policy of allowing people to walk and promenade in Moscow, which is something we are very proud of. They are clearing the squares for silly parking and are introducing even bicycle system is on its way, and you can find now that the mayor of Moscow will be making articles about how to make livable cities. It is a miracle. And I have here something about that Jane Jacobs in 1961, she wrote this book saying that if the modernists and the motorists rule the world, we'll have dead cities. And now, 50 years later, even in Moscow, they have heard the rumor and a full speed doing something meaningful about it. To me, that's a fantastic story. Um, this is Singapore, and we have no time, um, which I'm sorry about. But I have mentioned several times that I'm, I'm so impressed with what has happened in, in Singapore, and I was even more, in, more impressed yesterday when we went out to some of the outlying communities and saw how well they were planned and how many bicycles were all over these places um, in, in tem Temperines. Yeah, you know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we have the city center, and I think that many of the things happening here is quite impressive, but I think that what, what is needed is some better connection and I think that it would be a very great idea, like they do now in Sydney, like we are going to do on Main Street, Moscow, that we could have, um, we could link the interesting places so you can find them by having a light rail from the end of Orchard Street through the Padang down to the Boat Quay over to Chinatown and over to Marina Sands so that there will be a surface transportation which will take you to the important places and it will be a string of pearls instead of some pearls which you could hardly find if you don't know about them. And so I think that there's a lot of things which could make this wonderful city still more wonderful and certainly more livable. This is how Moscow Main Street is going to be. Maybe that's also Orchard Road in the future. So, welcome to the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you for your thought-provoking and spirited lecture, Professor Gell. May I now invite Mr. Wong to join Professor Gell on stage for the panel discussion and Q&A. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, later during the Q&A, could I please ask that you, name, you state your name and your organization before you ask questions or make comments. You might like to raise your hands so that our staff can walk to you with the mics. I will now hand the time over to Mr. Wong, please. Maybe everyone should know that Yan Gale is brought here to pedestrianize Orchard Road. No, just kidding. <laughs> but maybe it should be. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think that's one thing that maybe um, I think we should add to your indexes when you say about um, you have lively, you have, um, you have safe, you have uh, healthy and sustainable city. 
And I think one thing that I think it's missing is, uh, is, is uh, we are, I'm very happy that you're actually in Singapore and talking about this topic. Because um, where you come from, uh, Copenhagen is one of the most livable city. I think it's number one in the Monaco uh, list. And I think it's also one of the happiest cities, the, the people that are happiest. But unfortunately, Singapore ranks not the best city, not the, the happiest city, in fact, the least happy city, and also the most expensive city. And I think we do need to do something about it. And I think one of the things maybe um, you could talk about is how do you start to change mindsets, especially people who have the control. This story I've told is one long story of changing mindsets. And uh, every single city I've ever worked in, it always started with some people coming over and saying, you must realize that this particular place is very different. We have another culture here. We are not Danes, we are Italians, or we are Italians, not Danes. Or now you are in the Big Apple and you cannot ever realize some of the European ways of having urbanity here in the Big Apple, for God's sake. 24 hour New York, no way. Then they do it anyway and it's a fantastic success and the mindset starts to roll. So I've seen so many mindsets being changed and there's so many good examples now around the world and people travel and they hear and see and, and to me it's amazing that Jane Jacobs' old ideas in recent years have been transported so quickly from one culture to the next because they are basically very sound ideas about taking departure point in making good habitat, urban habitat for homo sapiens and concentrating more on that. So it's a very simple story which people can understand right away, but they have to see it and see that other cities have done it. They have. So I'm very optimistic. I think one thing too maybe we could discuss about, um, I think you went cycling yesterday and what is your observation in, in our HDB estates, do you think we could actually transform them into uh, very quickly into walkable and bicycle um, towns? Yeah, I think they could be better for these modes of transportation. But I, I do think that, that generally the quality of the modernistic buildings and the way they are done here is better than in many other places because uh, so much greenery has been planted carefully and is so well taken care of. So I can easily see that there's not far to go to have an even better uh, uh, habitat for human, human beings in these places. I, I was quite impressed with what I saw on our uh, tour yesterday and uh, that gave me a completely new uh, impression of Singapore. If you only go around inside here, you have one picture, but going out to these places, you have definitely another and more humane uh, impression, which was very nice. There's not that much to go, but, and it's certainly possible. Mm. I think one of the most difficult thing I think we will have to change the mindset would be, I think Singapore is a, a bit of a victim of our own success. And I think we, we try to keep um, the cars off the road and um, by keeping, by increasing the cost of the car. And now that the cars are cost, probably the most expensive place in the world to buy cars, but everyone seems to want one. Even our mid-level management would want to drive to work. And I think that's, that's something that it's, it's, it's going to have to change, I believe. And, um, and I think from yesterday's observation, it was interesting because we could see from the town centers um, the amount of bicycles we already have and that um, people were actually really using the bicycles. And I think that's really encouraging. I think there has been quite a shift in the last few years, maybe five years or so, and that um, a lot of people have uh, started using bicycles. So it is 
actually very positive, I think, that, that HDB estates, we could actually turn it into a more bikeable and walkable city. And, um, and also at the same time, make Singaporeans happy as well. <laughs> Out there. Um, I think that it's, it's a fantastic feat that Singapore now are running this, uh, you must help me with the name of the Prime Minister's Lee Q Yen Prize. Of Lee Kuan Yew Prize. Lee yeah. Kuan Yew Prize of fine cities of the world. And you're also having this World Summit yes. city conferences because it is a strong way of signalizing also to the local people that there are good cities and People are thriving around the world to make fine cities. We can see it. We can be inspired by this. And I, I know of several cities who say, let's run 10 conferences and then we'll be our, one, the world's most livable city ourselves because our newspapers will write about it. The people will look at it at the television. They, they will be the talk of the town and it comes back regularly. It's a very, very fine omen that this thing happens right here. So I, I think that it is well on its way, Singapore, to some, uh, to some of these mindset changes which will bring a more livable and happy city about. This, this, uh, you've been helping quite a few cities in the, in the world to, to transform the cities into more livable cities. Did this come from um, the bottom up or from the top down uh, request? It could come from anywhere. Um, but in some cases, there are definitely some strong political leadership, like uh, in Moscow, like in New York, um, like in Melbourne. But in Melbourne, it wasn't the mayor. It was the city architect who will say, I've had 16 mayors. I've run them all. So Rob Adams has had such a strong vision that he's been able to convince the mayors, this is where we go, and we, we are on a good track. So th that is some examples of, of coming somewhat from, from above and good leadership. But the fact that all these improvements for people are happening in cities is to me a sign that it's really coming from below because the cities are a much better now than the new towns and new constructions which are being made by architects and planners and developers who are not influenced by voters and by pe people's opinions, who are just doing what they were told in School of Architecture or planning. And there are really many awful places being built. At the same time, they are improving Moscow and, and, and New York and other cities. So where there are Voters, citizens, concerned citizens, it's generally going much better than when there are no undergrowth of citizens and users, but it's the professionals who are making the decisions alone. That's one of my observations. Maybe you have something to say about that. I think in Singapore it's interesting because I think um, the, uh, the general... Um, public um, is really interested in it and, and I think a lot of people are already on the bicycles. Um, and also I think people in, 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 in the various government departments too are also starting to, to make this change and want to make this change as well. So and I think the momentum has started. So I think it's something that um, Singapore can actually look forward to, to turning Singapore into a, a livable city. And I think that's, that's something that's quite interesting and quite exciting. And, and I'm very happy that you're actually here to help. Uh, but one thing maybe you can actually uh, discuss about it, uh, perhaps, is I think Singapore is a very hot and humid climate, and everyone will always want to ask that question. Is it sensible to expect people to commute to work uh, with bicycles? Why are they doing it anyway? No, I, I don't know what kind of use a bicycle could have here. I saw yesterday very impressive levels of bicycling happening in Champines. Um, 
because they've got the infrastructure, they've got the invitation, and then they can find a number of smart things that is easier to take the bicycle to this and to this and to this. It may not be to the city work, but then of course maybe you can do as many other cities are doing now, make, make either make good um, bicycle storage places at the stations, even at either end, as we have in Copenhagen, that you have two bicycles, one here and one there, and then you take the train, or you could take the bicycle on the train, which I think is an, is an obvious thing to work for. I know you have overcrowded trains, but um, you, you are going to improve the service, and maybe you can find room for that kind of service, which could give you an alternative transportation system, which will give more more uh, possibility in either end of the train ra ra ride to go to places. And it is really so smart to have two systems rather than one. I, I couldn't agree more. On my, on my walk to, to this uh, auditorium from Hong Kong Street, which is about, uh, say, 15, 20 minutes walk here, I have to cross four roads, four junctions, um, two with with the uh, traffic lights and about two without. And um, when I wanted to cross the one without the traffic light, the cars keep moving, and I actually counted the number of cars. And there's about 10 cars that kept moving and wouldn't stop. And um, I looked at the cars inside, and there were only basically one or two people in the cars. And as I waited, I could see about 20, 30 people swell behind me. So it's actually really not a very democratic um, uh, a traffic system we've got. So and I think that that's something uh, to look forward to is, is, a, is a more democratic approach in, in, in Singapore towards um, uh, traffic. But is it so simplistic when, when you talk about uh, the uh, bicycle problems you now have in Copenhagen that to overcome the, um, the, uh, the amount of bicycles now you, you have, you simply took away another road and um, would, were there another no lane. resistance? Another lane. Another lane, yes. Yeah. Mm. Was were there no resistance for the car users? Um, this, this was done in, in the most bicycle crowded streets. Mm -hmm. It was not done all over the place. Mm -hmm. Where it was needed, it was done. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they even closed the street and made it into a bicycle bus and pedestrian street mm -hmm. because they could not accommodate mm -hmm. the the cars also with all these bicycles mm -hmm. streaming out and they wanted to make sure that the bicycles felt that it was they were invited and it was mm -hmm. a good idea to bicycle. Mm -hmm. So they have reshuffled it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say there is much opposition because it is part now of culture that and and also they're working now to make Copenhagen very sustainable and uh, very green and CO2 neutral. Mm -hmm. So it's all part of a bigger plan of having a, a, a people-friendly, happy, green, mm -hmm. sustainable city. And, uh, and for many years, it's been not a good idea to take your car into the center of Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. When I was young, I, I, could, I always could do it. Now, I think three times before I take it in. It can be done, but it's complicated. And, and that's how it is gradually has changed. Mm -hmm. the, um, the priorities have changed. And we, we think it's all of all right because the city has become much better in the process. So there are more reasons to go there. But you can't go there in your four-wheel drive. Mm. I, I was watching TV yesterday and I was watching this mega city Jakarta episode. And um, the interesting thing about Jakarta is that um, they have only 6% of their land area used for roads. And they can't increase that because um, of the, uh, the problem with actually acquiring land. They couldn't acquire it uh, like we do in Singapore. Maybe that was a bad mystic that Singapore could acquire land for infrastructure, just like that. So, um, so their solution was they have to do double-decker uh, expressways in Jakarta, which I'm not quite sure really is the direction. I think you should hate to. Indonesia and talk some sense to them as well. <laughs> um, I think we should open this um, discussion to, um, to everyone. Um, 
Could we have your name and then the question, please? Rowing, microphones. Yes, here. Sorry, I got the mic first, I think. Yes. Hey, Yan, I'm John. Uh, you still haven't answered the question on the humidity. All the examples you have are from the temperate climate condition. And bicycling is the best thing to do. And I think Mansan asked you about our condition where it's not only hot, but it's humid. And that's always a killer for bicycling. And the comment about Singapore being not a friendly walking city is not correct. I'm a walker. I don't own a car. I take the public transport and I walk. If you know how to walk in Singapore, it's a beautiful place to walk. Okay? Bicycle is more challenging because we haven't created a safe lane for bicycle. Uh, but for walking, it's one of the best cities already. So I think that the idea of trying to ride the bicycle idea onto the walking mode is very doable in Singapore. Yeah? And I think, I'm not sure about your point about having the two ends huh? um, of bringing your bicycle onto the public train system. In your culture, it may work. In this part of the world, I think it may be the worst thing to do. But I like the idea of possibly bicycling within your neighborhood, going from your home to a station, and then taking the train to work. Because the way Singapore is planned, the place where people work are quite focused already. Okay? They're not all the place. And the residential are also focused in the other lobe. So it's just making that uh, network within the domestic residential area workable. And that will cover probably a large part of the areas already. So, so in the CBD area, whether you really want people to cycle or not, I think the verdict is still out. Because it's a very compact city in the first place. And the uh, MRT stations are well positioned. The buses are well organized. Uh, and you don't want too many people choking up the road with too many modes, I think. So I think if you really want to think of making this place a bicycle place, we have to be selective where we do them. The balance got to be right properly. I think the other observation I have is I live in a city. I live on Orchard Road, and there was one time across the road, every Saturday and Sunday is a center for bicyclists. But the observation shows that 90% of the bicyclists are expatriates. They are not Singaporean. And the bikes they own are worth $20,000 each one. So they are status symbol. See? They go to Orchard Road, they park their bikes there, and they gossip, and they show up the bikes. So, so one thing I want to ask you is that we have a problem here. The social transfer in Singapore is so significant that a lot of people have a significant amount of disposal income to want to buy a car, and they can afford to buy a car, despite the COE. Elsewhere, your largest big ticket item of the house, you put in, you got no means to do anything else. But in Singapore, because of the social transfer, a lot of people in the middle uh, layer of society can't afford to buy, own a car. And if you want to make this place a happy place, to deny them to own a car, I think it's quite challenging. Uh, like your, your opinion, please. Thank you. Yeah, you um, talked quite a bit about Singapore, and uh, I, I did not talk much about Singapore, and certainly I did not say that it was not a, a nice place to walk in. I don't know it, actually. I, have, I haven't studied it in detail. I pointed out that there, it could be a good idea to link some of the interesting spots, make them make it more easy for people to sort of transfer between these places and, and enjoy the city. Uh, that was what I said. I think that it would be interesting to study in more detail um, how Singapore really works for people. I always thought it was not a good idea to bicycle to work in Singapore. Yesterday I was a little bit in doubt when I was in Tampines because there was a lot of short bicycle transport anyway. And maybe the logical thing here would be to do not long bicycle rides, but short ones combined with public transportation. And that could be an alternative 
mode or moving. Um, but I would rather leave you to answer some of the questions because they were about this city. <laughs> and um, I, we, the next city I'm going to work in, actually, the next city would be Nuuk in Greenland, where also they, they bicycle a lot, though everybody says it's too cold. But the next one would be Shanghai. And, and when I work with Shanghai, maybe I know more and can come back and talk more with you. But anyway, you have I, I, I think you, you, you were right. I think um, uh, making shorter rides may be the solution rather than long rides because I think that's when you start to break out in sweat a lot. Uh, short rides make sense. So that's where I think um, yesterday was a good example when we went to Tampines. Tampines is a town of about 200 to 250,000 people. It has got two MRT stations. And I think the furthest block of flats would be, say, one kilometer to one and a half kilometer from the station. And that is easily, uh, you can actually ride a bike and also walk if you are quite uh, able. So and I think that is a very obvious uh, choice people could make, is to use bikes to go to the, the trains and then to come to city. Whether they would actually go from Tampines down to, to the city center, that I think, um, um, we would need a very integrated uh, transport system where people could bring foldable bikes where I like to... We had three foldable bikes in front here and people are already doing it. So this is a, it's a good example. One of our guys from LTA is here and he moves around in a foldable bike. And I think that's a good uh, to start. Good start. Yeah, it's a good start, yes. And I think, yes, I think Jan didn't say Singapore wasn't a... Uh, a, a walkable city, Singapore, compared to the cities around Asia, is a tremendously good place to walk. Yes. I think you I have think a we point have there. one question here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, excuse me, yes. Uh, Alistair Ferry from James Ferry and Partners Architects. Um, I just wanted to raise a point. I cycle 12 kilometers into work every day, or most days, okay? And I just wanted to get an idea how many other people in this room cycle to work? Okay. Now, what do you think the biggest problem is? Well, actually, I think one of the biggest issues is how many people have a place where they can have a locker and a shower when they get to work. That's really important, to actually have a locker and a shower where you can change your clothes and you can then be respectable. The other thing that I think is, <laughs> the other thing I think is very important is I live in uh, Holland Road area, and I use the park connector which is the old Malayan railway line as my route into work. And I only cross one road, and I can get all the way to my office. And I think that if one is gonna look at cycling in Singapore as a means of transport, is it's gotta be integrated with the park connector system entirely, which I think is where, where it's going anyway. Um, but this, I think, is perhaps a much more uh, interesting way to, to examine the use of uh, bicycle transportation over the island. Thank you. Could we, uh, oh yes, one question there, yes. Yes, uh, my name is Andre Chazar. I'm at the Singapore University of Technology and Design doing could, research. Could you speak up a little bit? Yes, at uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design doing research on users and usage of public space. I'd like to address a question to Professor Gale. Thank you for your uh, inspiring and interesting presentation. More generally than bicycling, since the talk is about people-centric, not bicycle-centric design, uh, you mentioned a lack of data as being one of the problems in getting people to uh, change their approaches to city planning. Data, yes. So uh, I'd like to know if you have some remarks on how big data, which we've heard quite a lot about, and the move towards sensing people's movements and activities could help or not help these planning efforts. Would they possibly give new insight to how cities should be planned or confirm existing knowledge 
or could they possibly even confuse the issue? Have they been used in any of the uh, planning studies which you did yourself? Yes. <clears throat> okay. It is certainly my point that as long as we have a lot of data about tr motor transport and no data about people movements and people joyments and people doings in cities, we have an unbalance. And we have found that it's a very strong political instrument to start to have knowledge about how people use the city because then we can, we can compare to other cities, and then we can have a base situation, we can make some changes, then we can test again and see if it has improved. When I retired from the University of Copenhagen, I got a very nice letter from the mayor of, from one of the mayors of Copenhagen. She said, if you guys at university had not given us all the data about the people's side of the story of Copenhagen, we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen one of the most livable cities in the world. She said that she needed the data to, in her argumentation to continue her policy of making a more nice city, more people-oriented city. So I found it's a very strong thing to have knowledge about the people in a the city. Then we can talk about how we gather this information. And I will not go into a detailed discussion about gathering by direct observation or by, by indirect observation, censoring and whatever. Uh, you will find interesting stuff in Melbourne where they have a complete automatic uh, people observation system which is on the internet 24 hours a day where you can see everything happening in Melbourne. So some of this can be found. Also, I've just finished a new book, which is called How to Study Public Life, because we realized there was never a handbook about how to do this sort of thing. So this book is out now in Danish, English, and Chinese. And uh, there should be even a flyer somewhere about these various books are made in English. I don't know where they are, do you know? Sorry? At the counter. Yeah, at the entrance, yeah. I think. Yes. There you can see these books if you are interested. There's more detailed discussion of the question you have raised. Uh, uh, yes, hello. Um, my name is Oscar. Uh, could we have Michael first, if you oh, don't Michael, mind? Yes, sure. sure. Michael Nui here from Market 61. I was at a workshop yesterday, uh, and I missed that right yesterday morning. I wish I had been on the right. would have been a lot more interesting. Um, as you know, I'm on a handbike. I was concerned that it might be too much of a challenge to all of us on the ride yesterday morning that uh, many of you may need to get down on a bike to get me over some of the hurdles. But in any case, um, it's so commendable to have you championing this cause to create and make livable cities. Uh, I saw the transformation of Melbourne the last, over the last 30 years. I went to school there, returned there to work, came to Singapore 20 years ago. And the last 10 years, I saw Melbourne being such a livable city from the pictures you saw show earlier on. You, it is evident that you are very good in what you're doing. But what's following, what I'm going to say is, it is your, your, your success and your formula seems to work across geographical and cultural settings. That's, that's really noticeable to me. One question I wanted to bring forward to you and see, perhaps you could share with us what sort of charm and or skill sets you might have that you have been dealing with city traffic engineers to convince them that more bicycle lanes and less vehicular lanes actually serve the city needs. How do you go about doing that? Big question, but could be a short answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, there has been a great development in the, tr in the education of traffic engineers in the last 30 years. Uh, there are 
a number of places in the world and schools in the world where you have very nice traffic engineers being educated who has a great understanding that it's not about making cars happy, but making ha people, citizens happy that the, that the work is about. I have also come across the old school of traffic engineer who is inoculated with concrete and gasoline. And especially I met some of those in, in, in Russian and, and in the social, former social republics. They are really tough guys. Um, but modern traffic engineers are generally much better education and they are getting better and better. Um, so traffic engineering is becoming much more refined and there are many more things, answers to the questions than there were 30 and 20 years ago, which is wonderful. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting to work with this new generation of people who have a much softer. In Copenhagen, we had for many years a traffic engineer who played cello in a string band. And he was a very soft guy. He thought that the purpose of traffic engineering was to keep traffic out of his city. And he was, a, he had a number of funny ideas and all of this helped in Copenhagen. But, but again, there was a personality there. He said, if people can't park, they won't drive, which is correct. And then he said, if I take 3% of the parking out of downtown every year and don't tell anybody, <laughs> nobody will notice. And then he started to do this over 25 years without talking much about it. It just went down all the time. And the traffic was dropping all the time because, like me, it was more and more complicated and, oh, no, I wouldn't take the trouble. I take the, the train to the city on my bike. And at the same time, he, he shifted gently over to other uh, modes, bicycling and bus and, and subway, whatever. Uh, so he was a very interesting chap. He also thought if there was congestion, go out and remove a lane right away. Then you have a really bad congestion for three weeks, but then people have understood this not a smart place to go at that time of the day. If you add another lane, you will have more problems in three months from now on. He had a number of interesting ideas. That generation of transport planners, are there more and more of those who think a little bit uh, abstract on the things and try to find good solutions for the society rather than for General Motors. I, I think, Michael, um, I think the problem in Singapore with, with maybe our traffic engineers and LTA is that um, the KPIs are how quickly we move traffic. And I, think, I think one thing we have to change is to change from quantitative to qualitative um, uh, KPIs. I think there's actually a, a survey done where um, the longer distance you have to travel, actually the more likely that you will not be happy with your job satisfaction. So the job satisfaction actually drops as well. So uh, it's actually corresponding to that. So I think the point is maybe we, sh we need, I, th I think one of your points too about the, the whole idea of Liverpool City is really to, to a holistic way of seeing things. It's, it's just not about um, walking or riding a bicycle. It's all about um, the way of life. And I think it's, it's actually important that uh, all the departments in Singapore, everyone in Singapore, talk about the same agenda of making Singapore a livable and more sustainable city. We have someone else? Uh, yes, uh, hello, my name is Oscar. Um, I am an architectural enthusiast and um, I love architecture and um, I think it's a very magical field. I uh, just have a couple of questions. Uh, our cities are very massive, they're ginormous, and um, we always want to bring people to the cities, to the city center. And why don't we bring city center to the people? Why don't we add um, several city centers to our cities? For example, maybe for Singapore we can add a city center on the east, on the west, 
and maybe a couple or two, three on the north. And then that way the cities will be, I can work in one zone and I can definitely cycle to it because at the moment it's almost impossibility for me because I'm not very fit and I cannot really cycle 20 kilometers to work and from work even if we make it very cyclable and it's, it's impossible. Or the, the other one is where we have several factories and a lot of the workers, where they actually live in Malaysia and they commute from Malaysia and then right through the Singapore to work and from work each day, it takes them two hours. Why don't we build a center where very economical and cheap housing for these people. So they live very close to, to work, then they can cycle to work and then they can raise their children. And it, I think it's a lot user friendly and it seems like no one touches this subject and we still live in one centralized city, which is so, so yesterday, so wrong. Uh, thank you, Oscar. I, I think URA would actually uh, tell you that it's already part of their master plan to have sub-centers, and that was already in, the, in, the, uh, in, in two master plans before the current one. So the plan is actually uh, uh, there, and actually is, is actually being put to, to, um, to practice, actually. So I think that, that that's already taken care of. Yeah, excellent. That's the way to go, I yes. believe. Yes, amazing. Um, yes. Thank you. Could we have the microphone over there? Can Sorry. I speak? Yes. Thank you. I've been trying my best, but I was out of your range. My name is Maria Boy. I'm actually in different profession. I'm a planner. I happen to be very lucky to be in HDB, and I plan Tampines and Pasiris. And I'm um, now in Subana, but I practice more as a landscape architect because I qualified from Sheffield. I'm also president of the Institute of Parks and Recreation, secretary to the Sin Singapore Institute of Planners, and uh, now the council member in the Singapore Institute of Landscape Architects. So my experiences are as a planner. In Tampines, when we did that, that time we didn't have the cycling policy, but we have bicycle parking in the void deck, which means that the people can park and cycle around. And I recently did a voluntary study on Woodland, how people cycle in Woodland. And I interviewed people as well, go in the night, day, and whatever. And a lot of them were saying that it's education, getting people to respect each other. And definitely it's possible to cycle within our towns because there's so much less traffic, especially on Sunday and weekend, the people are somewhere else. So cycling can be a lifestyle in new towns. And recently I did a, a project on cycling in the city because in 1988, I wrote an article about cycling in the city. And I find that my cyclist told me the first thing is hazardous because too much traffic light. That is very true because when I cycled with one of the founders of the Love Cycling, it was a lot of traffic light and he told me that even at the traffic light, we should slow down the traffic and synchronize it. And through this exercise of the cycling as well as a workshop, which I want to get students involved, they were so busy. And when we want to get people to come to a public forum, they said they have no time, they are working. So it was very difficult for the public to get involved. But one thing I see in Singapore, which is very, very strong, is that as long as the government and the MP ministers are having a will, we can get things done. And that's why Tampines was successful as a modern cycling town. And now they're going on to even Amokyo, Nisun, and Woodland. So there's a lot of hope in cycling in Singapore, in the towns and in the city. But cities, we need a, a lot more planning because how do we prevent all this too much traffic light? Cycling is very unpleasant. Whether they are professionals and they own expensive bike or the layman who cycles because they have no other means of cycling to work. You know, like those laborers, they cycle in the town very often, every day and things like that. So there's another new mode of mobility. It's now the skate scooters. When I did the study on cycling, I found that this mode of skate scooters, which is on the wheel, and they're not allowed on the road, they've become a new mode of, uh, of using the mobility in the city. So I've, I have great hope that 
with different government working together, we will be achieving cycling more in the city as well as the town. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, there were many observations and, and suggestions, whatever. Maybe I will uh, give a general good advice, and it's not at all radical. And that could be something you could start to do tomorrow, and you will have much fun out of this. Um, in many cities around the world now, they realize that on Sundays the streets are not used as much as on the other days. So they close a number of streets on Sundays and say, on these streets you can have all the fun you can think of on Sundays between 9 and, and 3 in the afternoon. In the city of Bogota in Colombia, they close every Sunday 120 kilometers of streets and they have a fantastic people festival. Every Sunday, everybody comes out with their children and bicycles and rollerblades and dancing and karate classes and everything and happen in these streets and they can also take the full tour around the city on these closed streets. In New York, they now have summer streets. In Chicago, they have summer streets. In London, they close Regent Street in the summer. In Los Angeles, they close streets. They close streets many, many places. And this is to, the, to give the people some fun and also some exercise and also let them see, realize that bicycling could be fun and possible and generally having some fun. And it, the idea is that over time, maybe there will be more uh, willingness to see some changes in the infrastructure towards combining fun and transportation. So close some streets on Sundays um, and make it a, re a reappearing occurrence so that people can have more fun and exercise their bicycles and their children and their girlfriends. We have, uh, we will take one more questions over there. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, Lim Tong K from Sky Rice Communities. Um, Mr. Jell, you, you presented uh, with a slide of a very huge modern uh, building with um, hardly any life in it. You stop there, then you show and go on to the other parts of public spaces which you have helped uh, uh, people to reclaim back and bring back a more humanistic society or humanistic city. There is one area which I like you to think about and that is the area of reclaiming the public spaces that we lost when we moved from a more communal type of living into high-rise buildings. And it is at the smallest unit of a community at between four to eight households on a segmented corridor on every floor in a high-rise building. Could this be the last frontier that, uh, of humanizing society, the way we live? Because today we live very private lives. Uh, we know, hardly know our neighbours, we are less tolerant, we are very efficient, and we have less babies too. So the modernists have destroyed our societies, uh, our, our com uh, buildings, the way we live, especially the smallest unit of our community. And what is your vision of uh, maybe uh, improving uh, building, uh, planning regulations to help uh, bring about uh, more humanistic society at this last frontier that is to bring back uh, a more communal way of living. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood all the details in your question. Um, maybe you could help me a little bit. Yes. <laughs> the short summary? Short summary. I think the... I think um, the point was um, maybe the, the modernist way of doing uh, planning has removed a lot of the social spaces yeah. from, um, from, um, from the communities. And I think the question was a little bit to ask how we could actually bring this back. Yeah, 
That's the question of, in China, you used to live in a nice little Yutong, Hutong, and now you live on the 42nd story in a high rise, and a lot of things have changed in your possibilities for quality of life. And uh, this is a reoccurring problem in many countries, and many projects have been done to, to try to address this um, it's, it's something about bringing in the small human scale in a places which have a very big scale. And there is a number of examples. It is not very easy, but there is a number of, of examples here and there um, where uh, by, by other landscaping, by defining smaller spaces at the ground floor and whatever, that a smaller scale and more personal scale have been brought into. Uh, there's no single answer to this one. It is a, a very, it's a very dramatic change for the habitat of, of Homo sapiens to be taken from a small environment to a big environment. And uh, I think it's a very important question you're raising. I have no ready answers, but I could show you a number of examples where people have worked with this problem here and there. But maybe, as I know that we are coming to the conclusion or coming to the end, I will just, I'll quote uh, Enrique Peña Loza, who used to be mayor in Bogota. And he is a very, he's a guy who has thought much about a lot of things. And he made one observation. He said, it is amazing that so little knowledge, we have so little knowledge about a good urban habitat for Homo sapiens, because we know so much about good habitat for mountain gorillas, for Siberian tigers, for whales, and for the love life of elephants, but no knowledge about what is a good urban habitat for Homo sapiens in climates different climates across the world, it is amazing that so little has been started in this area. I have myself that feeling that I cannot understand that my humble books are used all over the world, but I realize it's because there are very little done and written about these things. And I think that we could study much more and we can be much better. And I look forward to that. Thank you for Today, it's been a great experience to be back in Singapore. And I come back again in June for the World Summit. I can hardly wait. Thank you, Professor Gell and Mr. Wong, for sharing your insights and experiences with us. We would now like to invite Mr. Ku to present our speaker and moderator with a token of appreciation. Mr. Ku, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our lecture. We thank you for your participation and do join us for our upcoming lecture next month, where we feature Mr. Bernard Harrison, the founder of Singapore's Zoological Guidance and the world's first night safari. We will also be seeking your feedback via email and would greatly appreciate if you could make, take a minute to help us improve the lecture series. Have a great Friday and a weekend ahead. We hope to see you again. Thank you.